West to Harm in Freyond and welcome to yet another video. Oh boy, it is the time again, my dear friends. A review of the Rings of Power. Oh, well. And this time it is episode 7. And let me tell you, my dear friends, I was bored to death this time. I was doodling the entire time in, in between of making notes. And of course, I watched uh, the show 1.5 speed, but it still wasn't enough. I just couldn't wait for it to end. I always say when I'm doing these reviews that, oh, this was the worst episode so far. But I'm sure each and every time that the next one is going to be even worse. And this is no exception. Welcome, my dear friends. Uh, if you are visiting this channel for the first time, welcome to European Lore, a channel of a humble little European who has devoted his entire life to the finer things, the fantasy genre, the good old English literature, and of course the works of Professor Tolkien. I have devoted my personal and my academic life to it. And feel free to check out my other reviews and videos, not only about the Rings of Power and the Lord of the Rings, but about other fine things. And because I, uh, I have been an avid reader and uh, a Tolkien aficionado my entire life, I have devoted this channel from a huge part to protecting the legacy of Professor Tolkien. And that is why this show, I consider this show to be the biggest crime against humanity. So, of course, let us dive into it, my dear friends. Well, we follow three storylines this time. We follow Galadriel, and of course, once more, I do refuse to pronounce the names as if they were written by Professor Tolkien, because 100% of this story is written and made up by Amazon, by Prime Video, by the showrunners, and uh, sanctioned by Uncle Jeffy and uh, the abhorrent Tolkien estate, who just couldn't wait for Christopher Tolkien to pass away so they can sanction this atrocity. And I will pronounce... I will pronounce the names the way they should be pronounced because they come from Amazon. So Galadriel, of course, survives the periclastic flow or whatever you want to call it, unlike most of the inhabitants of the Southlands. Uh, if I knew that um, elves were fireproof, I would have thought that they have nothing to fear from balrogs or dragons, but uh, it seems that uh, it's only a privilege of uh, a Amazon's um, Joan of Arc Galadriel. But of course, um, only the red shirts die, quite obviously. All the main characters, all the protagonists survive, and uh, they get separated. Uh, Galadriel travels with Theo, they have their little adventure and uh, speech, during which, my dear friends, oh, guess who gets mentioned? Oh, Celeborn gets mentioned, and of course, this is direct law-breaking. So, the pact that they had, Amazon with the Tolkien estate, that they couldn't uh, contradict the law, yada, 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 it was all lie, all lies, but we knew that from the first episode, and it is being confirmed each and every single episode, this one as well, Celeborn's being mentioned, and he is apparently dead, now I don't think he's really dead, but Galadriel mentioned that uh, she saw him uh, the last time before he went to battle and then she never saw him again and that his armor didn't fit and that she called him Silver Clam. So yes, our boy Lydriel was uh, mocking her husband, uh, whom she never left, according to the law orally. From the beginning of the Second Age, they were almost inseparable. They traveled everywhere together and they did not join any huge battle, any huge war. So once again, breaking the law, breaking the law, na 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 na. We've got some cringy dialogue, of course, and lines such as when Theo was asking Galadriel, "How many orcs have you killed?" and she says, "Many." Ha 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 ha! Ah, this is so. No, well, anyway, um, the only thing uh, the Rings of Power is uh, sticking to as far as referring to something that was done before them is here and there a snippet a member berry that could potentially remind uh, normies or fans of the Peter Jackson's trilogy, of all things. In this case, not only Peter Jackson's trilogy, but also Ralph Bakshi's uh, The Lord of the Rings, the animated one, because there is one specific scene when uh, Galadriel and Theo are hiding under a rock. Not rock, uh, roots of a tree, sorry. And there are orcs looking for them. 
and uh, you've got this snippet, this short that uh, looks absolutely like that short when uh, the hobbits were hidden under the you know, roots of a tree and uh, Nazgul was looking for them. Though, of course, uh, first appeared this snippet, this picture in uh, Ralph Bakshi's film and then, of course, uh, in Peter Jackson's trilogy. So, yeah. So, uh, finally, they get together. They... Uh, find themselves, everybody, they uh, reach a Numenorian camp. In the meanwhile, we get to know that Elendil has lost his seal door. Oh my god, and now he's angry at Gladriel. He's very angry, he even cries. All right, so we've got Gladriel calling Celeborn uh, a clam, a uh, silver clam, and then she never saw him again. And uh, Elendil cries like a little baby. So once again, girl power, girl power, and all men are useless idiots. In the meanwhile, of course, uh, what's the name? Uh, Miriel, who of course, according to the law, should have been born about 2,000 years later and uh, does nothing that she does in the books. Uh, um, she should be really the uh, last heir to the throne of Numenor. And her husband was then uh, Arafarazon, but he forced to marry her under her will, uh, or against her own will, because uh, he wanted to usurp the throne of Numenor. But nothing, none of that is here. Uh, so, Elendil's angry at Gael. And the last scene we've got of this storyline, and that concludes the entire episode. Don't worry, we will get to the other storylines story as well. But uh, the episode ends with, guess who and what? By Ardar, of course, surviving, celebrating with his little orcsies that they have found their own land. And, and indeed, that which I was mentioning the last time really happened. They bloody created Mordor by this. So the key that they had that was in the form of this sword handle and they put it into a keyhole, they, they switched, or I mean they, they turned the key and they created Mordor. This is one of the stupidest things I have ever seen on television. Now, you could think that they would at least, you know, hire good writers and good screenwriters. If they are not sticking to the law, they might at least come up with a good story. I was wrong. And also, do you remember uh, the videos that I was making before the show was out? I was saying, all right, if it was not called The Lord of the Rings, I would be interested in it because it might be a fine and good fantasy show on its own. No, it couldn't! Because it's shit anyway. The writing is nonsensical. There are things happening that don't make sense even in a fantasy genre. Now, I despise the people who are saying it's fantasy, so anything goes. Uh, everybody who says that uh, doesn't know anything about world building, anything that doesn't know anything about storytelling, has apparently never read any book or wrote any story. Because there have to be rules within uh, the secondary world, even if we don't apply the, the first, the, the primary world's rules to that secondary world. So no, none of this makes sense, it is all very bad. But the Mordor, this is going to haunt me. I really, I, I, th I think I might have to get drunk tonight. So, Harfords. So, they are uh, found, in, at the beginning they find uh, burned places too. But, you know, because the ashes and the debris from, oh God, uh, Mount Doom, Orodruin, Amon Amarth gets even there. So, they want him, the meteor man to fix it. And uh, so, he tries Right, he touches a tree, but he doesn't manage, and a branch almost falls on the head of a little half foot. Oh my god, and so you know, all drama, drama. But we see a little flower springing from the uh, root or a branch of a tree, and then um, the Lenny Henry says uh, that uh, uh, Meteor Man should leave, and he points him to Greenwood the Great. Once again, member berries, member berries. Nori gives him an apple. Oh my god, big goodbye. But we know that they are going to meet again. You don't, you know, it's not even suspenseful. It's not, you know, if it was at least suspenseful, if you were at least um, empathizing and sympathizing with the characters, but no, it's all very predictable. Uh, well, not all, apart from the biggest crimes against the law. But as far as the character development, quote-unquote, is quite uh, predictable. 
So he gives him an apple, and uh, then you know, another day, and she wakes up, and the and, and she finds out that there are apples everywhere, and uh, everything is growing, and there is like new spring because Meteor Man does a, the or did the magic. He did the magic and he fixed it. He fixed it. Oh my god! So the half woods eat and eat and eat. La da 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 da. And the witches, bitches, come. Damn it, damn it, damn it. Yeah, the witches, bitches arrive and uh, they are looking for the meteor man. And uh, so uh, Nori finds them and the other half woods too. And the witches, bitches burn their little village or I mean their little carriages, which is awful. Awful. You know, at the end, they really deserve it. It's really karma, because if they are willing to let their own kind die and leave them to bees and just go on, carry on on their adventure, I think they deserve it. And uh, so they decide to find the Meteor Man. Nori first, of course, and then Sam joins her, and then uh, uh, Lenny Henry joins them. It's like the ripoff of that scene in the Fellowship of the Ring. You have my axe. Yeah, sure. So we uh, and this particular storyline ends with them going off to the distance looking for the Meteor Man. And uh, probably the most boring um, storyline uh, revolves around Elrond and Durin the Fourth, who travel to Moria to make a pact, uh, a bargain with uh, Durin the. Third, by the way, according to the law, there were never two Durins living at the same time, because according to the law, all the Durins were really uh, like an incarnation of, uh, or reincarnation of the first Durin, one of the first uh, dwarven kings and lords. There is this very cringy scene when uh, the old Durin speaks about Aule, the, the Vala, who created the, the dwarves. But he speaks about a very different legend, which once again, there you can see that they have absolutely no uh, rights to adapt the Silmarillion. So you only cringe and uh, you only clench your teeth when they are trying to do some world building and trying to vaguely refer to some names from the legendarium. But you know, they don't have the rights for it, so they have to come up with their own bullshit. Um, <laughs> it's just all in all very bad. It is bad as an adaptation, quote unquote, because it's not an adaptation, but it is also uh, bad uh, on its own as a standalone show. I can't imagine how they could think they can make a second or a third season. This is absolutely dumb and stupid and idiotic from them. Oh, there is scene, and that made me actually uh, yeah, very you know, cringe very much <laughs> when they were saying farewell and they said Namaria, my favorite farewell, you nitwits. That didn't make me feel very good. So, this is so tedious. So they find out that the Mithril actually heals the leaf. Oh my god, so it's true. So it's like mana, it's like a health potion for the elves. Which is dumb. It's, it's absolutely dumb. The, the, the people who came up with this idea, they belong to an asylum. And I would gladly pay for their stay there. But of course, the old Durin doesn't like it, because there needs to be a, a struggle between a father and a son. So the two Durins struggle, and the old Durin doesn't want to give the elves the Mithril, and the young Durin wants to, because he's a very good friend with Elrond, yada yada. And uh, so old Durin uh, orders the other dwarves to seal the, the shaft where they found Mithril, and uh, we get the, the, uh, the shot of Balrog from the trailer. Uh, I, as, as I said, if I wasn't bored to death, I would cry like a Lendil uh, when he was uh, when he met Galadriel for the last time in this episode. There is nothing more I can say other than that um, I'm. You know what? I thought that this show could not surprise me. But this show is surprising me every time I see it. Every episode is surprising me by, by uh, the audacity that uh, Amazon, uh, the showrunners and the screenwriters and the directors and Jeffy Bezos, that they have to call it 
the Lord of the Rings. And I really can't understand how can all the shells live with themselves. How can anybody call themselves a Lord of the Rings or Tolkien fan and not hate this to the core of their hearts, to the core of their bones? I just don't understand. The shills who call themselves Tolkien fans and um, shill for this show are the lowest form of life in our universe. And I mean it 100% seriously. That will be all. Let me know in the comments down below what you think about the latest episode of uh, The Rings of Power. I have to go and have a drink. Na Marie.